Researchers are very conscientious, and in terms of the general data protection regulation, there's a lot that researchers are already doing right, so there should be no need to panic. Um, researchers are used to being trustworthy processors of data on behalf of their human subjects, and they care, and they go about informing people of, about their research and getting the proper consent, so none of that needs to change. But there, are, there may be some legal issues that haven't been thought of before. So for example, if you're tra transcribing um, an interview and you're hiring someone to do that, you want to make a legal agreement because they're a data processor of that data and that's a risk that you need to make sure that you've accounted for. Another um, aspect is if you're sharing data that involves human subjects, you may want to create a data use agreement with the person you're sharing it with. It's certainly a good idea to use the guidance of the university's data protection officer, which is online, or contact them, or talk to us in case it's something that, that we can help you with in the first instance, the research data support team. Yes, I think the question of sensitive data, you know, troubles lots of researchers. And I think, um, I mean, partly because there's some confusion over the, <laughs> the term in a way, because it has official meanings in the Data Protection Act and the um, GDPR now. Um, and then for, say, social scientists or some kind of humanities researchers, what might count as sensitive or not sensitive kind of varies. But I think um, we really also have to think about what is it that's sensitive for our participant, which may not be the same as what's sensitive for us as researchers. So I think that's the first thing that we need to kind of disentangle, really, is um, who is it sensitive um, for um, or to, um, and really take our participants um, kind of lead on that in terms of what they think um, needs, um, you know, needs to be considered as specially sensitive or not. Um, but the, the other thing, I guess, is because the, um, you know, the kind of recent history of the social sciences has been to, um, to uh, the way of taking care of data has been to kind of lock it up or destroy it <laughs> after um, interviews. And that's been seen as the way to kind of manage sensitive data is that you kind of destroy it afterwards. But there's, that's really changing now. Um, and so now there's the kind of possibilities of um, sharing data and archiving it and making it public um, in various ways. Um, so I think um, so I think we need to think about all data really carefully. All data needs really careful attention, but not all data needs to be locked away. So yeah, I think it's really important um, now at consent forms that we include. Um, the possibilities of lots of different ways that data might be used in the future so that our consent forms don't just include, oh, as a researcher, I'm going to use the data in this way for this particular project, but that we um, include the possibility that the data might be used um, in the future, which might be the, the very near future, or it might be the far future, um, by other researchers or indeed by, um, by non-academics, maybe, if we... Um, make the data available in that way. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, something like the GDPR will, um, will maybe have this effect because it's, it's um, I guess, driving us to think more about a more granular approach to consent and um, kind of breaking consent down um, explicitly in different ways that data might be used. So I think the question of what to um, share um, through a facility like DataShare is a uh, you know, it's a really important question for researchers to think through now. And um, and I think, you know, not so long ago, this question wouldn't have been on um, researchers' agendas, I think, in the, in the way that it is increasingly now. Um, and so I think once the question would have been, oh, can we, sh can we share anything? Is there anything that can go into the public domain? But I think that question is really shifting to um, thinking about actually why not share this through data share? So rather than thinking, what is it possible to share? Actually, now I think the question is a little bit more like, well, what's the rationale for not sharing uh, data? Um, so, so I think we need to think, again, really carefully with all of our data, yeah, needs this kind of careful attention and careful thinking through. Um, and I also think then that participants need to be kind of part of that. 
um, process so that when we're having interviews or encounters with people that we're um, putting that idea into people's minds so that they can think through for themselves um, what the implications might be for them. Also so that the decision um, is not one that the researcher is making alone, but the researcher might be making in kind of conversation with uh, research participants when that's appropriate. So the Research Data Service has a couple of new initiatives that will help people who are dealing with personal data, the researchers. So in the active phase when they're working on the data and analyzing it, if, it's, if the data is too sensitive to use on the normal data store service, which is what we have for everyday research and it gets backed up and it's centrally located, they can apply to use the data safe haven. And in that way, the data stays on a secure server, and the only people who can access it are the approved researchers who go in through a remote desktop. And so it stays safe. There's no copies proliferating and being left on drains and things like that. We also have, on the archiving side, the data vault, also a new part of the service in which sensitive data will be encrypted and put on tape for long-term retention as long as the data needs to be kept and it will be securely destroyed at the end if that's what's needed or preserved further.